Welcome to Inside Kern. I'm your host, Katie Price. Inside Kern's goal is to give you a better understanding of what goes on here in Kern County. If you're like most of us, you sometimes find it a challenge to organize your household and stay on top of your monthly expenses. Just imagine having to manage the affairs of hundreds of thousands of people. That's basically what running a county the size of Kern amounts to. How do you decide how much money to spend and on what? and what restrictions are placed on you when it comes to making those decisions. These are all questions we try to tackle in this special segment of Inside Kern. From the beautiful hills of the Tehachapi Mountains, to the vast Mojave Desert, various lakes like Isabella that dot the land. To the oil fields that pump valuable crude. To the bustling city of Bakersfield. and the 10 smaller outlying cities. Kern County is a diverse, sprawling area that covers more than 8,000 square miles and is home to more than 800,000 people. Geographically, Kern is the third largest county in the entire state of California. It's rich not only in oil, but agriculture, with billions of dollars worth of crops grown here every year. To run a county the size of Kern, you need officials who understand the needs of residents. Those needs are as diverse as the county's topography. You may find it interesting that many folks in Kern County have no idea what the billion dollar plus annual budget pays for. What services you're afraid will go away or be cut because of the county budget cuts? I can't think of any. <laughs> what you're afraid might be cut, you know, service-wise, because of all the budget cuts in the county? I don't know. <laughs> Probably schools. Concern with the teacher hours and uh, counseling hours. I appreciate the sports, but I don't believe that's the most important thing. I believe it helps some students, and I see it help, helping in some, but I think that we need to keep our teachers, keep our uh, students coming to classes, the classroom that's going to matter for their education. In fact, some people even believe that the county's budget is a secret, somehow being kept from the people.
people know what the county budget actually pays for all the different services? I don't think I don't think so. I think they like to just give us just like a kind of a sample version for us just to kind of think, oh, okay, you know, that's where it's going. But I would, would love to see where it's really, where it's really at, you know what I'm saying? But I don't think we'll ever find out. However, just with any public spending plan, Kern's budget is open for any and all to review and study. Well, actually, the county budget is very complex. We, we provide a number of varied services from public protection to uh, providing infrastructure and road, uh, road improvements economic development and so the county budget is made up of uh, a, a number of departments that provide these services and uh, then what we need to address first are the mandated services to those departments and uh, so when discretionary funds are provided to departments for mandated services that, that's really the first piece of it and then the discretionary portion of the budget uh, are uh, so, programs and uh, services that we provide, but uh, have we have more flexibility in use. The Board of Supervisors has more flexibility in use of those funds. Altogether, Kern County spends more than a billion dollars a year on public safety, roads, libraries, child protective services, environmental health, and a host of other services. Contrary to what some think, the county doesn't fund local schools. Public schools are funded by the state of California. I think we're concerned about the JV football program here in Kern County School District. Um, I think if they cut the JV football and baseball and all those programs, there'll be a lot of kids that will probably not go to school and. Uh, a lot of the ones that go to school. Um, the other stuff we're concerned about, you know, I don't really know all the things that they're cutting, so. The schooling. We, our son is supposed to start preschool next year, and we live in Wasco, and they cut the preschool so we don't get to go. Here's a breakdown of the services Kern County does pay for. One third of the budget pays for public safety. This includes the Sheriff's Department, fire department, district attorney's office, and local jails. The biggest claim on the general fund is public safety, uh, with uh, more than a third of the general fund. More than a third of it is, is, uh, goes to the, the sheriff, the district attorney, uh, probation services, uh, public defender, uh, the county's contribution to the state uh, superior court system, which has a, a branch here in every county as, as, as uh, incurred. One third of the budget goes toward public assistance. This includes Child Protective Services, or CPS, the Welfare to Work Program, Foster Services, and the Jamison Shelter for Abused Children. Then uh, public assistance. A lot of that is actually state and federal money with a small local match. But that has just about 30%. Uh, that's assistance to families with children. Uh, they need to train for, look for, seek, and hopefully find employment in order to remain eligible for the funds. And they can do that for up to five years before they're cut off from, the, from this aid program by, under federal law. Uh, it also includes uh, child welfare services. Uh, child protective services. When, when families, uh, as they unfortunately often do, uh, don't take care of their kids, instead they abuse and neglect them, then the county by law has to step in, take those kids out of the home, and uh, try to stabilize the situation, find a new home. Uh, also, that includes foster services uh, uh, to try to find uh, permanent homes for these kids. Uh, it also includes uh, aging and adult services, or you know, there, there's there's elder abuse that that uh, we have to keep a very careful watch on. There are senior nutrition programs that the county operates. We also operate a program called in-home supportive services. Uh, that's mainly Medi-Cal money and some state money and some local money. That's grown very fast uh, to try to keep people in their homes and out of nursing homes. So that's public assistance. Another large chunk of the county's budget pays for public health and safety. This includes services such as the health department, environmental health, and animal control. 
I don't think people uh, really know just how many services that they get from the county. It's not just the sheriff's deputies that uh, arrive when you call, but it's also we, oper we help to operate the courts, although that's largely state. We, we kick into that also. Uh, you've got probation, you've got the public defender, the district attorney, the fire uh, stations. We have 45 fire stations around the county. Uh, the roads, the county has 3,300 miles of roads to maintain. Uh, we have an uh, extensive uh, network of parks that we maintain all around the county, including Buena Vista Aquatic Recreation Area, Lake Maine, those are county facilities. Um, a, a lot of parks in every community, just about. We have uh, more than two dozen library branches around the county. We are one of the few uh, counties that runs a, a county library system in, this, in California. We maintain uh, animal control services. That's, uh, that's a county operation. Um, the uh, elections are all run by the county clerk, everything from school board to presidential. The uh, taxes are assessed on your property. Your property taxes are assessed and, and uh, collected by the tax collector and distributed by the auditor to all the various local districts and to the state, by the way. So the county is involved in a lot of different aspects of public life. Uh, restaurant inspections are conducted by the public health department. It's important that you have confidence that where you eat is, is, is uh, not going to make you ill. <laughs> so they uh, maintain pretty tight controls on restaurants and, uh, and uh, caterers. So there are a lot of different things that the county does for people. You might be asking yourself, where does Kern County get the money to fund all of these services? A question that seems to puzzle quite a few. So besides the state and the federal money and the property taxes, uh, the county has uh, fees and uh, other taxes and charges for services and that's roughly about a quarter of the budget uh, as well. So, and, and that part unfortunately has had to grow as we've gotten less discretionary money that we get to hang on to ourselves. And, that, that's a part of our argument with Sacramento is if you leave us our property taxes you know, leave us our local revenues then we can take care of our own needs and you know, that, that way local taxes go to support more local services and not simply to backfill for mandated services and we don't have to turn to you for fees and charges all the time. Every time the state budget is done and in between we're constantly battling with them to to give us the money that we need to pay for the services you tell us we have to provide. Uh, in recent years, we've even actually had to take more local resources to provide that level when the state doesn't give us the money that we need. In fact, 40% of the county's money comes from state and federal sources. 15% of the money comes from local property taxes. 25% is generated through fees charged for various services, and 20% comes from other sources. Every county has to borrow funds for operating capital, for operating cash, uh, because we don't just get a steady flow of, of cash. We get property taxes just the, the same way that the state gets income taxes. We get property taxes in two installments per year, and that provides a big influx of cash. Uh, we get quarterly uh, payments from the state, we get uh, quarterly uh, sales taxes. Um, but that, you know, that, there's an ebb and a, and a flow to the, to the county revenue, so we have to borrow money ourselves. The biggest uh, single source is uh, state. Uh, about a quarter of the county budget comes from the state, uh, and then when you include federal money, that jumps up to about 40%, state and federal altogether. Um, it's 40% of the county budget. Property taxes used to be about a quarter, but since the state has uh, taken away a lot of our local property taxes and it's come back in the form of mandated uh, uh, programs, uh, property taxes are less now. They're, they're uh, less than 20%, anywhere a little over 15%. And then you've got uh, other charges for services uh, and fees that, that we charge for different county services, permits and things like that, because often uh, that's the only way that a lot of departments 
uh, smaller departments like weights and measures or animal control. That's a substantial part of their budget. They, they instead of having all taxpayers pay for uh, the services that are used by maybe only a small portion, we have to charge more fees to make up for the lack of general fund revenue. When the state uh, takes away a lot of property taxes, that that's less discretionary revenue for the departments to use, which means instead of being funded from the general fund, you have to turn to the, to the people who, who are using your services and ask them to, to pay something for them. They, uh, you know, they pay their property taxes and <laughs> they expect something in return. They don't realize that not all their property taxes you know, stay here. Some of them go to Sacramento. When the state you know, doesn't pay us and we have to to, to, uh, to pay to keep services going and they delay their payments. We have to take it from somewhere. That means we take it out of our own cash reserves or else uh, we have to go and borrow the money. To, because uh, you know, we, it's not like we're uh, sitting here uh, just on top of piles and piles of cash. The, the, uh, a lot of that it has special purposes to it and we can't touch it. When we run these services, if the, if the state doesn't pay us, we still have to, we can't just shut our doors. We have to continue to uh, write checks to people. We have to continue to provide help to people that's mandated by the state. And, and an example is uh, the roads uh, department. When they delay uh, the, the county's share of gasoline excise taxes, that hurts. Uh, that means somebody's going to have to take up the slack because you have road projects ongoing, you have contracts that have been let, you have people that you have to pay to patch the roads, and, and uh, you can't just shut shut down. You have to keep operating, and you're waiting for the state to, to pay you the money. It's a free loan for them. Although the state and federal government supplies the largest chunk of money, they also place what's called mandates on counties, meaning they must spend the money on certain things in order to receive the funds. About um, three quarters, a little, little less than three quarters of the county's budget are program specific funds and uh, where the board has uh, no f flexibility in their use. There are funds that need to be dedicated to mental health programs, to welfare, public assistance, uh, to roads, uh, also for uh, fire services, public safety services, and those kinds of things. Those kinds of services that we provide. So uh, the board has little flexibility in, those in, in the use of those funds. And that's really the, the largest portion of the county budget. Then the discretionary piece of those funds, again, we ha uh, the board has more flexibility in their use. Funds that go to uh, keep our libraries open or to uh, provide uh, parks and uh, recreational areas. I think we have greater flexibility uh, in terms of providing funding to our uh, public defender, our district attorney, some of the judicial services, uh, probation department. Those are somewhat discretionary, uh, but they're key services the ca that the county provides. So uh, while we have a little more flexibility in their use, there are still those services that are the priority of the board that, w that we do fund. Priority services are for public protection. Fire, uh, fire department protects our lives and our homes. Uh, the sheriff protects the citizenry. Probation supervises uh, probationers in the, in the uh, public safety arena. The public defender and the, the district attorney uh, are involved in the judicial system and protect the citizenry as well. Uh, we also have uh, other services, again, our recreational areas, our libraries. Um, we provide mental health services and medical services uh, through our county hospital. Um, county services also maintain our roads and our infrastructure. We provide for economic development. We work with uh, the building industry as well as our county grows. Um, we also provide public assistance for those uh, who are less fortunate than we are. Uh, so, so we provide a, a variety of services to the citizens here in the county. Another important thing to understand is that local officials only have so much control over how they spend the county's money. Not only are there state and federal mandates, but there are also what's called discretionary and non-discretionary funds. Uh, remember we said that number of about one and a half billion dollars. Uh, more than three-fourths of that is uh, mandated 
program specific revenues, either you know, solid waste fees or passenger fees that support the airport enterprise fund or state and federal money that we get. Uh, you know, Forty percent of the county budget is state and federal money. That, is, that has very definite strings and attached and purposes that it must be used for. So right away when you take three out of four dollars off the table that leaves one dollar of quote unquote discretionary money for the board. But even that money also is really you have not a lot of, of uh, leeway in how you spend it because again the sheriff needs to have a certain basic minimum level of coverage you'd like to provide more. But even that minimum level claims a lot of the discretionary dollar. Uh, you must protect, uh, it doesn't, the law doesn't say the county has to have a fire department, but somebody has to do it either by contract with the State Department of Forestry, in our case we do it ourselves because we like to manage our fire services. That costs a lot of money. Uh, public health costs a lot of money. Uh, and and uh, a lot of that money is not paid for by the state even though we're supposed to have all of these services we offer. The state doesn't provide dollars for it. So a lot of local tax dollars go for things that the board doesn't have a lot of discretion over. But the only, once, you're, once you get down the list of, of uh, mandated, not mandated, but essential, and get to what's truly discretionary, you're talking about the libraries, the parks, farm and home advisor, the board of trade. Um, and these are all things that also have their own important uh, constituencies and clients in the county. You know, the board of trade generates a tremendous amount of uh, tourism for the county which throws off a lot of dollars to our local economy. So you don't have to have one, but if we didn't have one, our economy would feel it. And anytime you cut back on that investment, uh, it, it, it has a consequence at the other end. Uh, libraries are important to people who, you know, we're in a very poor county where people don't have their own computers and they rely on the public libraries for uh, online access to the internet, which is really, uh, uh, I wouldn't even say important, it's critical, it's essential. It's not even an option anymore if you want to participate in the economy to be online. The libraries where a lot of people have to go, they don't have that option at home. Parks are important, you know, it's, 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 a, it's an important th that people have a place to go and recreate and uh, relax and, and in fact in the summertime the parks are uh, an important component in public safety because they run cooling centers. We're getting some very very hot summer days in these recent years and this will be the uh, third summer now that we've run cooling centers to uh, uh, keep people safe that can't be uh, cool in their homes. Okay so now you know what the county spends its money on and how it generates that money. But how do specific departments make decisions that affect us, the people they serve? We'll take three departments for example. The Fire Department, Environmental Health Services, and the Department of Human Services. Fire Chief Nick Dunn has a huge responsibility. He oversees 46 fire stations in nine cities that span more than 8,000 square miles. It's a job done doesn't take lightly. The county fire department covers the entire county. It's over 8,000 square miles of area. And within that, we have 46 fire stations to accomplish that mission. The problem is we have a mountain range between the San Joaquin Valley and the desert area, and we have responsibility on both sides. So what that does is that basically splits our responsibility areas and makes it difficult in some cases to be able to, to get our personnel there to assist when we have major fires. But that's the challenge that we've lived with forever with the county occurring. And so we cover everything within those areas from the desert to the, the metropolitan part of uh, Bakersfield up into the Tehachapi's, Pine Mountain. All those areas are covered. The county fire department protects the unincorporated areas of the county along with nine cities we have contracts with. And that goes from the city of Delano, Maricopa, Arvin, Tehachapi, uh, Ridgecrest, all those areas that, uh, that have their own cities but have county fire protection are key components of our team. In tough budget times, Chief Dunn says his department may have to cut equipment and supplies, but it tries to keep as many firefighters as possible. In our case, we have to perform a mission and so we have to start cutting at the lower levels with our supplies 
and the things we use to support our areas because our personnel are our number one concern to get out there to serve the public and so that's the last thing we want to cut. So we go through the entire process of equipment and supplies and services that we do to support that. That's where we make our first cuts. It's extremely difficult, Ed. The county fire department is a very lean machine and we work hard to make sure that we're good stewards of the county dollar. And so when we start cutting, those are things that, that are really necessities to, to fulfill our mission. So that's a, that's a difficult thing to do is to make those cuts. Not only do firefighters fight flames, but they also perform other duties you might not think of. What we do with the fire service is we're, we're fire and emergency response. And so that's emergency medical services, which are a large part, large part of what we do within our response. You know, in, in the Pine Mountain area, we have paramedics now that are working in the Pine Mountain area, paid for by the Pine Mountain communities to perform duties up there, which is something that's new for us, and it's outside of our normal, our normal way of doing business. Well, the one thing about the county fire department, in some areas, we're the only county service there. And so people will call us to help with, with any of their needs that they would normally be calling someone else for. And that can be from coming to assist them with a broken water line to, uh, to moving a, maybe an invalid parent or back into a bed, whatever we have to do to help them. And that's what we do. You know, we also have our fire safe councils, which we're very involved with, which our seasonal fire crews go and clear brush and make sure that we're able to stop those fires in areas that we would normally not be able to stop them. But we work with these fire safe councils, which are an outstanding tool to make sure things are happening to take care of those issues. What we've been able to do is to look at how we how we present our services, how we respond. We look at the things that we are that we have done on a constant basis for the past years that probably should have been looked at. And that's what we're doing now is we're reevaluating, we're trying to reinvent the county fire department to make us a leaner, meaner, more efficient team. If anyone has a misperception about the, the fire services, we care about what we're doing and we work hard to make sure that the county dollar is spent in a very appropriate manner. And it's imperative to us that those people that we serve understand what our mission is. And our mission is here is to serve those. Although you may know what services departments like fire provide, what about other departments like environmental health services? Matt Constantine is the head of the Environmental Health Services Department. Like Chief Dunn, he takes his job seriously. Environmental health provides those services throughout the county um, and in all 11 incorporated cities. There's a few smaller functions that uh, the city of Bakersfield provides, um, but overall there's approximately 12,000 permits uh, that we issue annually and we then inspect or audit or review their processes to help them uh, do, do business safely, conduct business safely. Environmental health is to protect the community and our environment. Um, we do that in a number of ways. Um, we have different regulatory programs that ensure businesses. It could be a hazardous materials facility that handles very dangerous chemicals. It could be the drilling of a water well to provide water to your home. It could be the corner market that prepares food for you, um, but we ensure that those actions um, are done safely. And they seem to be kind of disjointed subjects, but the common nature of, of all of them is uh, we want to make sure that the services or the products or processes that occur uh, are safe. It's that simple. The Environmental Health Services Department is unique in that it generates all of its own money. Well, environmental health is in a somewhat unique position as far as county departments go. We rely on permit fees that are collected from the businesses that are required to obtain a permit from us. So we charge a fee to provide a service that we're legally obligated to. In the past couple years, we have received some money from the state that represents approximately 2% of our budget. So overall, a approximately 95% of our budget is generated from permit fees. When the economy struggles, so does Constantine's department. If restaurants close, for instance, money from those business permits dries up. Um, if 10% of uh, our businesses fail 
or choose to relocate, um, you know, that might be um, a six or seven hundred thousand dollar loss to our revenue. And with that loss, then I need to reduce staffing to reflect that change. So even a minor change can make a significant impact. And we, it's very important we monitor that because it's not fair for me to charge for service I haven't provided, nor is it fair for the public for me not to provide a service that I should. Um, that fee covers our service, and it doesn't cover more, nor should it cover less. Um, so it does present challenges for us to adjust and adapt quickly. Uh, we don't rely or have the ability to go back to uh, the county and ask for additional money. So like a business, we uh, ebb and flow depending on the demand. And so we have to very carefully track um, our costs and the, the revenues that are coming in to make sure they match. But when times get tough, the public suffers. Constantine points out that there are 70 billion foodborne illnesses reported in the U.S. every single year. You know, it's, um, we are kind of the silent uh, safety net, uh, and a lot of the public doesn't see what we do, and it's intentionally that way. Uh, however, if we are reducing services, um, we are going to be unable to provide the level of oversight to some of our local facilities. So we, we have a number of, we have, let's see, we have 3,500 facilities in the county that handle hazardous chemicals. That's a lot. It's surprisingly, a lot of facilities uh, have different chemicals. A lot because of our petroleum and our agricultural based economy. But what we find is when we're not there providing that oversight, providing the education and the guidance, um, and many times there is sort of a lax approach to some of those dangers. And people that deal with it all the time become familiar with it. But my concern is by cutting services, we increase the risk of some of those chemicals being released. We also increase the risk of foodborne illness outbreak. For you or I, or most people, their immune systems are healthy and we recover, but for folks that are, have suppressed immune systems or are older or younger or pregnant, that presents a, a life and death situation. Government is not able to be everywhere at every time. There'll be an expectation that the private individual take more responsibility for some of those actions. And, that goes for businesses too, and we would hope to see that most businesses would step up and continue to do the right thing. We have a, a, a tremendous level of respect and compliance from most businesses in the county. They do just fantastic. There are a few, though, that present a lot of problems, and we focus a lot of our time there. And so I guess those are the areas that are concerning for the future. Cheadle is the head of the Department of Human Services, or DHS. Unlike many departments, a big chunk of its money, 86 percent, comes from the state. Only 14 percent comes from local revenues. DHS funds a myriad of public assistance programs, such as CalWORKs, Medi-Cal, Welfare to Work, and Child Protective Services. This department also handles adoption and foster care, as well as the Jamison Shelter for Abused Children. People either just think that we're Child Protective Services or they think that we're welfare. They, they don't refer to us as human services, um, but, but they don't realize that, that we're the same. I also want to mention that we operate the Jamison Shelter, and, and again, that oftentimes is is thought to be an independent um, agency from our department, but they actually are part of Human Services and we provide shelter uh, to children there. Typically the shelter is for children that are six and older um, while we're waiting to get a foster home for them. Um, with children that are under six, we, we try to get them into an emergency foster home right away, but, but sometimes they are there. Um, we also, while they're there, we have a, um, an agreement with her medical center. We have an on-site doctor. They, they do whatever medical exams are, are necessary while the children are there. 
for continuation of their medical care. In bad budget years, the Department of Human Services is forced to cut people, which in turn cuts services to clients. The last thing Cheadle says her department cuts is services that focus on child safety, like CPS. We actually have two different budgets. Um, the Department of Human Services has a direct aid budget, which basically um, all of that money goes directly to the client. It's to pay for the, uh, the cash benefits, it's to pay for uh, the food stamps, it's to pay for the foster care payments of children that are in care. It also covers payment of uh, adoption assistance programs. So, so that money goes directly, directly to the, top, to the client. Um, our administration budget is used for everything else. And when I say everything else, that's staffing, that's the cost of buildings, that's our supplies, that's our, our cars, because you know we have social workers who are out in the field every day going to home. So while we don't have fire trucks, we do have a need for, for county vehicles for transportation for our social workers, as well as transportation of children to visitations and to other medical appointments. Also includes any contracts that we that we may do with the community and we have a number, a number of contracts. Our department has worked very hard to um, engage our, our community partners in providing services to children and families. The most difficult task that we have um, as a human services agency, because, because we are a helping agency, and, and any time we start to, to make decisions about cuts, we immediately realize that the human impact on the other side. It's one of the questions we ask. How many, how many children is this going to impact? How many families is this going to impact? If we cut this contract by 25%, what does that mean? How many children aren't going to get service? How many, how many adults aren't going to get that service? And, and it's a very difficult thing to do. And that's why you know, we, we resulted to the, the tiered approach that I mentioned before. And, and I think that that helps a, a lot to, to look at, you know, OK, here's your, here's your mandated priority services. We have an obligation to do this first. And then once you've met that obligation, then you go to the, the other services that support that. And you start to look at the impact and how many people they serve and what would happen if, if they weren't there to serve those clients. And what impact will that further um, present to our community? Because if you, if you don't have any money, you can't pay rent. So that then affects your your homeless population, you know, ultimately it, it affects other services because, you know, when families, when some families are desperate, they will result to doing whatever they need to do to take care of their children and feed their children. And, and sometimes that places them at risk of, of ending up in our juvenile court system or a, a, even our adult court systems. And so, you know, we, we always talk about prevention services and, and we, we very much see our public assistance program as prevention. Altogether, Cheadle's department serves more than a quarter of a million people. Half of the DHS budget goes directly to clients. Services like cash aid, food stamps, foster money, and adoption assistance. The other half of the money goes to the administration budget, which covers salaries, vehicles for social workers, buildings, and contracts with community groups that provide services to clients. Our first priority is to keep families together and to strengthen families. Um, we, we know more, more that, that children thrive best when they are with their families and, and it's a very traumatic situation to remove a child from their parent in any circumstance. Um, so that is our ultimate goal. The other services that are provided in Child Protective Services is um, our Permanent Placement Division and the Adoption Program. We also have um, uh, a licensing and relative assessment unit in terms of priority if a child cannot be uh, placed with his own biological parents the uh, the next priority is to look for a relative or to look for uh, what we call a, a non-extended uh, family member or relative uh, to care for the child and then foster care and then group homes and FFAs are, are part of that priority as well. Cheadle wants the public to know that the people being served by her department are also helping to drive our local economy. And I'd also like the community to know that, you know, sometimes when they think about public assistance programs, they, they think about 
it in a manner of its taxpayer money and and its um, the, the, the people who receive it are people who don't want to work and that is, a, is, is not true. The majority of our clients come in and they use the system for what it was intended to be, a temporary resource. Um, many of our clients and families are working while they're receiving assistance and so if you're working and earning minimum wage or even slightly above that and you have a family of three, you're not earning enough to be to be self-sufficient. So we have many families that work but, but do receive perhaps food stamps or, or Medi-Cal benefits to, to make sure that the family gets those other services. And, and the benefits that are paid in the community, um, they, they really do provide an economic stimulus. That's money that's spent right here in our community. Um, you know, if they, if they receive food stamp money, those are spent in our, in our local grocery stores. Um, if they get cash, those are spent in our, in our local communities. They pay rent to landlords, they, they buy clothes, they, they, they fuel the economy. And I think that that's an important point that um, sometimes our, our community forgets. And, and I'd also like to, to just say that the, um, the, the face of who's walking through our door has changed. These are people who have worked all their life, who have been out of work, who are now out of work. These are, these are people that are um, our neighbors. They're, they're people that we sit next to in church. They're people that we see walking you know, in our neighborhoods. Um, so, so the face of who's receiving public assistance has also changed. As with many other things in life, the county's budget ebbs and flows. There seem to be cycles of good times and bad. However, that doesn't mean that good things don't come out of bad times. You can become complacent when uh, you have enough money to do things exactly the way you've done them in past years. And uh, you have less incentive to, uh, to try to do things differently. Uh, we're always trying to improve our processes and uh, we could always use more money like for automation. That's a, that's a case where more money intelligently used can result in a lot better service because people are served more quickly, more conveniently. They don't have to physically be at a place to receive a service. They could, we're trying to get more forms done online, more business done with the public online. It doesn't mean we don't want to see you, but we recognize that it takes bodies to see the public and the public has to take time out of their busy day to come to a county location. So we do try to operate more efficiently and a lot of times the, uh, the lean years show you how to do things a little, work a little smarter. Uh, again, we try to work smarter and not uh, deliver less service. We want to always try to have the least impact possible on services to the public when we have less money to work with. It forces us to look at ourselves from an outside perspective. What can we do, number one, to be good stewards of the county dollar, and number two, what can we do to make things different? And sometimes different isn't always bad. And what we've been able to do is to look at how we, how we present our services, how we respond. We look at the things that we, are, that we have done on a constant basis for the past years that probably should have been looked at. And that's what we're doing now is we're reevaluating. We're trying to reinvent the county fire department to make us a leaner, meaner, more efficient team. It does cause you to re-examine how you deliver services, um, but I, this is something that we've really pushed in the last few years regardless of the budget. But common examples would be we now have GPS units in all of our county vehicles. We can get online and look where every one of our departmental vehicles is located and if we have an event I can quickly say, hey, instead of driving from Bakersfield to Ridgecrest, I have an employee in Mojave or in Tehachapi or in Lake Isabella it may be easier for them to respond directly. All county departments have turned more to the internet and technology in order to streamline services and cut costs. Uh, we've also really enhanced a lot of our electronic information. Um, a lot of, all of our information now is public, you know, it's all public record, but we all now put it out for the public to see. So instead of the public coming in and asking for information, and requiring us to spend time pulling the information, making copies. We just put it all out online. So for example, an inspection of a facility today will be online tonight at 6 o'clock. Shows you exactly what we saw and what we documented. 
Um, we do a lot more on the web. Um, we do a lot more with some of these social networking tools, Twitter and Facebook. So uh, we have a lot of interest in food recalls, for example. And food recalls now, the immediate, as soon as we receive them from the state or the federal government, we not only put them on our website and start contacting the um, retailers, we put it out on Facebook and Twitter to get that information out as quickly as we can. Before that took a lot of time to try to disseminate it. And everyone seems to agree that when times get tough, the public has a responsibility to step up and do their part. We'd like everyone to, to take the responsibility of not littering in their parks and, and uh, picking up after themselves when they enjoy the parks on a weekend. It doesn't always happen that way, so maybe when you see the trash not getting picked up as often, it makes you a little more conscious of your own behavior. We're not asking you to, to go and empty the trash cans, we're just asking you if the trash cans are full, you know, bring your bags and, and, and put your bags by the trash can, and because uh, we know that you know, on busy weekends, uh, it's, it, it results in a lot of use, heavy use, and there's going to be a lot of trash. The restrooms are you know, going to go longer between cleaning, so it's, it's basic common sense. Don't trash the restrooms. These are your restrooms. They're put there for you. <laughs> Don't trash your parks. Uh, but obviously people can't, uh, it's not their responsibility to keep the roads fixed. That's what they pay their taxes for, so they have a right to expect something in return there. Uh, and I understand that people get angry when they see potholes where they didn't used to be or it's, it stays there a long time. Uh, and and that's, it's just a constant battle from the board to figure out how to allocate all the resources uh, to, to keep these services going. Um, when it is unavoidable to cut the budget, the first thing we look at is what are our legally mandated obligations under the law? What are the services by law we have to provide that we can't go any lower than? Uh, and these are things like um, uh, uh, welfare to work, uh, uh, the jails, uh, the courts. And, you know, we have to we have to keep our contribution going to the courts. We can't just because we don't have the money, we can't tell the state, "Oh, we're not going to give you a check for the courts this year." But we have to do all those legally mandated things: uh, certain minimum public health standards, certain minimum road standards. But uh, then. The next tier is, okay, we've, we've, we've met our legally mandated responsibilities. We also have certain public health and safety responsibilities that are mandated by law. The, the law says you have to have a sheriff and you have to have a jail. It doesn't say how many sheriff deputies you have to have. So even though it's not legally mandated, it is considered an essential service that you want to have uh, police coverage. You want the deputies to arrive when you call. Otherwise, public safety is in danger, and that's always been a, a top priority of the board. And you go down the tiers from there. Um, the board says often that there may be tier two or three or four departments that are not that great in importance, but some of the functions they perform are tier one functions. Things like restaurant inspection, things like uh, ag inspector inspection of, of, of the ag products that are shipped out of the county. Um, Recording uh, marriage and birth and death certificate. You have to you have to keep current on those records. You now these are things that people don't think about much, but they're kind of part of the underpinnings of what we call society and civilization. Again, though, I think the responsibility is on the operator to ensure that they serve safe food or they handle the chemical in a safe manner. Um, but you know, we are not we we are not out there to promote necessarily what we do. We want to ensure the public remains safe and you only hear about what we do when a business or a company is struggling with compliance and that's inherent in our profession. I think it's important to recognize what we do provide and I think it's important to recognize that we do that at no cost to the general public, that it's a fee supported program. When we are providing services, we're providing services to families that are in crisis. Um, I, I'm not sure that there's anything they could do other than, you know, make sure that when we give them paperwork that, and they come in that the paperwork is complete. But, but really, we're, we're dealing with families in crisis. Service remains a priority, um, although it, it may be impacted, it, it is still our, our priority to serve our community in the best way possible.
and it's it's still our goal. You know, our mission doesn't change. Our our mission is to strengthen families. Our mission is to keep children safe. Our mission is to provide access to safety net services for families that, that need them um, and to help families move to um, self-sufficiency and family stability. So that, that doesn't change. Those are all still priorities. And, and I'd also just you know, like the public to know that, that you know, the department is good stewards of, of their money that comes in. Um, you know, we, do, we, are, we are good stewards of the money while providing the much needed services to our community. Government by law is an open institution. Instead of being baffled by it, take the time to understand it and help government work for you. Because ultimately, this is your county. As you can see, Kern County's budget is a complex machine. It takes knowledgeable staff, dedicated employees, and you and I, the citizens, to keep it running properly. If you'd like to learn more about the county, you can go to our website at www.co.kern.ca.us. On behalf of myself and the entire KGov staff, we hope you've enjoyed this special look inside Kern.